What's up, guys? This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long with the Friendly Bear Podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of having Bryce Foose on the podcast. He's a prop trader from Seven Points Capital, a remote trader, and he, he has a unique story and a unique background with pharmacy. So he was able, he worked as a pharmacist and still does, and was a, and also trades in the size of, as a prop trader for this, for Seven Points. And I first learned of Bryce through the old podcast of Beyond the PDT. This is like a couple of years ago. And um, I decided to reach out because that podcast stood out to me. And uh, I reached out to Bryce. He was up to these days and he was he was uh, in, happy to come on the podcast because he's like, you know what, we need an update on me because it's been a few years. Uh, the world doesn't really know what I've been up to lately. Because <laughs> I think that was the last podcast he did. And so here he is. He can. Bryce, how's it going? Good. How are you doing, David? I'm doing great, man. Here in Puerto Rico, uh, it's pretty warm. It looks like, it, I don't know where you are, but it looks, it doesn't look that cold over there. It's actually been a pretty nice weekend for once. We've been, uh, had some pretty nasty snow uh, last couple of weeks, but uh, finally kind of melted off this weekend. So I was able to get outside, get a little sunlight. And finally, it's, it's been, uh, it's been a long winter. Um, where is that at? Uh, so it's St. Louis, uh, so Louis. central, like Midwest uh, U.S. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause sometimes when I interview people, they have a sweater and a hoodie. I can already sense like it's uh dramatically cold, but you're not wearing a sweater and a hoodie. Yeah. So no, it's sixties uh, here. So not, uh, not too hot, but I mean, we've had days actually it's supposed to get here a couple of days this week back down in the twenties and thirties. So. Awesome. Uh, so, so, okay, let's dive right into it. So um, how did you get started with seven points? Um, yeah, from and the the pharmacy background, which is really interesting. Yeah, you want to talk about your background? Yeah, so let me kind of start off. So I, I started actually in in 2011 um, was kind of when I first got into the market. Um, I was in pharmacy school then, uh, close to finishing up, and I had a, a friend that was into it and um, showed me a couple things, and and pretty soon I had a little Scott Trade account, and and kind of away I went. Um, and I, I feel like I gradually got more active each, each year. Um, I started out kind of just swing trading. Um, I did that and I started to, to kind of dabble in other strategies here and there. Um, so I, I met um, Mike Cass from Seven Points in uh, 2018 in Vegas, uh, October of 2018. Kind of talked to him a little bit about a remote deal, um, see if we could would get, get something going there. Um, I was still still working, but uh, my hours mainly evenings and weekends. Uh, so I still had a ton of time that I devoted to the market. Um, and so after a couple of exams, I was able to, to trade for them from capital. And um, and so it started off, you know, pretty slow, like like most uh, traders. It was a little bit of a transition for me uh, trading prop because I've traded, you know, on my own for for years, you know, so I never had anybody kind of watching over me. I didn't really have a, a daily lock. And so there's some different adjustments took me, uh, I'd say probably a good 30 to 60 days to kind of relax and be able to trade. Uh, I think it's different for everybody in terms of transition to prop, but, uh, but I was, I was gradually able to kind of uh, to scale up and um, 2019 was my first year with them. 2020 obviously got crazy with COVID in March of 2020. Everything kind of changed. Um, I was able to kind of gradually cut back my hours uh, as a pharmacist. Uh, and then I ended up in August 2020, I ended up kind of shutting it down. So I, I just do one shift every four to six weeks just to kind of stay in the game and, um, you know, kind of good balance for me, I feel like. And I don't really want to cut that tie altogether at this point. But um, Basically, just in 2020, I mean, the opportunity cost just got to be too much. So um, I had to make a decision. And that's what I did. 2021, I was full time the, the whole time. So it was the first first year since, you know, 2011, I've been totally full time market, which I guess it doesn't sound the greatest for, you know, if I compare a lot of traders. But uh, 2021 was phenomenal because uh, I was able to devote, uh, you know, pretty much every every single day full time you know, to the market um but yeah so that's that's where we're at gotcha so so you met in vegas you met the yeah. seven points guys in vegas what what is that a specific event or yeah so so trades for cause, trades um, for cause. okay 
Yeah, so a charity event. I uh, started in 2014. Uh, I went there. Uh, 2014, I was actually there uh, every year except for 2021. Um, I was in a wedding, so I, I had to miss that one. Unfortunately, I was I was pretty bummed about missing it because um, it was quite a bit different. I feel like going back after the last couple of years, if I would have been there in 2021, uh, it's a little bit different uh, levels as, as opposed. To as, as opposed to when I, when I was there and, you know, earlier years, kind of just trying to figure it out basically. Um, yeah. But no, yeah. So uh, yeah, great conference, um, incredible networking. Um, so, so yeah, I, I met, uh, yeah, cats there in October of 2018 and, and that's where it kind of all started with seven points. Right, so were you looking to trade prop or, you know, what were, what was your going into that conference? You know, were you like, what was your goals? Yeah. So, um, it's a good question. I had, I had an idea of, of maybe talking to, uh, to a couple of guys in the prop world, uh, kind of seeing what they could do. Um, I was at the time, um, they were doing their trade takeaways and, and cats would do, uh, one, I feel like at least once a week, and I would I would try to watch every single one of them. Um, and I was I was pretty impressed by mainly the way he managed risk and just ex- his explaining the trades, stuff like that. Something I had never really seen, you know, that professional. You know, you look at Twitter and you know, there's all kinds of stuff, but um, you know, that professional trade analysis, I feel like I really kind of attracted me to it. And um, so they they have a kind of a VIP event on Thursday night and Luckily, I was good friends with one of the guys that was speaking, so I got to go, and Cass was there since he was speaking, and I just went up to him and started talking to him, and um, and then, you know, the conversation, I feel like, went pretty well. You know, obviously, we had a couple drinks here, so it helped, um, <laughs> but I, I kind of talked to, you know, a few of the guys from the firm throughout the weekend, and, you know, after a few exams, I, uh, I was ready to go, so it worked out well. That's great. Um, so, so at that point you were a pharmacist mm-hmm. or, and you were interested in trading because you said you were, you were trading here and there since 2011. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> 2011, I mean, towards the tail end, I think it was like maybe October, September, 2011 is, is kind of when I first got into it, kind of bought my first stock, opened my first account. Um, and then since I was in pharmacy school, I was looking at other biotechs, mainly small cap, and it was something that I could just, you know, understand a little bit more in terms of the, the pipeline, uh, maybe a little bit of the, you know, how could it affect the market caps of the companies, stuff like that. Um, so it was, it was kind of just kind of met up for me in terms of those uh, commonalities, if you will. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, now your pharmacy background, like, were you trying to like make it work? like trading biotechs. I, I'm just speculating. Yeah. Trading biotechs with your pharmaceutical background, you were just trying to do that? Like, is that always your focus before? Yeah, my, my focus definitely was in biotech. Um, it's It still is. I mean, I definitely trade other sectors for sure. Um, you know, when I when I see edge, obviously there's, you know, way more edges, but biotech, I, I feel like is, is pretty misunderstood. Um, you know, there's just so much that goes into it in terms of, you know, the FDA process and, um, you know, goes on and on, you know, the pipeline, how it can affect the market cap, different uh, kind of issues the company can kind of run into, um, you know, if they get the drug approved, um, you know, what sales might be of this drug if it actually is approved, uh, on approval, like what would it really be worth? Um, so stuff like that, but. Oh, so you, so you, so you focus on, or you, you would, that's your goal, right? To focus on the biotechs? Is that your strength? Yeah, I, I feel like biotechs is kind of the, where I have the most edge. Now, I learned a long time ago, the market doesn't give a shit what I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, price action is king. Uh, in my earlier days, I definitely got, um, you know, a little too biased of, you know, what I thought and, you know, what the market thought or, you know, I mean, obviously the stock's is going to do is what, what it's going to do regardless of what anyone thinks about it, right? So, um, you know, I, I, I always take my opinion with a grain of salt with the market. I learned that a long time ago, um, that, uh, you know, what, regardless of, of what, you know, or what you think you might know, it, it really, it doesn't matter. Right. So, 
But when 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 I do have a thesis and price action confirms that thesis, then um, you know I use that kind of knowledge base to my advantage, um, you know, to profit uh, and and to increase profits. Absolutely. So I, I that comes what comes to mind for me is the last podcast we did with uh, Beyond the PDT with Matt Monaco and Bryce. I don't know if you kept up with them, but they're doing really well now. I don't know if you know. Yeah, I, I've seen. Uh, I guess a few things on Twitter. Um, yeah, they're killing think- it. What's that? They're killing it. They're killing yeah, it. Yeah, I heard. I've, I've seen a few things they are doing well. I think they got their own podcast, stuff like that, which that's good. Um, yeah, I think, you know, obviously OTCs and stuff like that got super hot. At, yeah, that's know, when, was, yeah, Matt Monaco made a, made a lot of money on the OTCs. Yeah, when it was hot. that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned, okay, so I remember in that podcast, you mentioned uh, getting squeezed on dries. <laughs> And like, uh, yeah. yeah, so how was that like? I mean, Dries was, was one of the ones that will go down in infamy for the rest of like yeah. the stock market history. Yeah, you know? so <laughs> yeah, thinking back to Dries, um, it was quite an experience. Um, I, I think it, you know, it was quite an experience for a lot of people. And I think there's a lot of people that, uh, you know, that was maybe their last trade. Um, yeah, they're they're Uber they drivers were, now. There's a lot yeah. more Uber drivers. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when I think back to Dries, I, I'm on it, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I kind of mentioned that past podcast, I'm really thankful for that experience, because, um, you know, what held me back kind of as a retail trader is I would have some, some really good periods of consistency. And then there were times where I'd maybe hesitate on a stop, or I would be on a hot run, and I would just kind of let one go, you know, maybe oversize here and there. And, you know, once in a while, I'd get hit. Um, it would wipe out, you know, maybe weeks or, you know, maybe a couple months of profits. And then Dries was kind of that line in the sand where I just said, you know what, well, like I have to, you know, have a max loss. I have to, you know, as soon as it breaks, you know, some sort of, you know, ideally the most significant resistance, I just have, I have to be out. Like you just, you never know how high a stock's going to go. We just had in the last two days, right? We had that uh, what, ISPO, ISPO, what? Yeah, go to from 10 to 10 over 100. And then CPTN also. Yeah, CPTN goes 10 to 80, um, you know, and right back down to 30 and after ours. And, you know, there's things are skipping up 20 bucks. You know, I mean, good luck. They're trading so thin that I mean, I don't think you can, you know, first of all, the locate's obviously very tough to get and expensive if you got it. But, um, you know, I think those are good examples of you never really know how high the stock's going to go. So, you know, I think thinking back to Dries, like I think the biggest thing I took away from it is you just you have to have concrete rules and you got to stick to them. Like if, you know, you cannot uh, you cannot deviate, you know, you so so currently I have I have all like all my intraday short positions. I have hard stops on. So my exits in terms of getting out are already predetermined. Um now, some of them I may have spread out or I may have a separate stop on an ad. Um, and I always have roughly a dollar amount I'm, I'm willing to risk, um, roughly, because as I've grown, there's been some issues with slippage um, and you're never going to get a, a clean to fill um, unless you're trading super small. Um, sometimes slippage can really hurt. I've had some days where it, you know, it's significant amount of slippage. Um you know, versus what I lost versus what I, what I anticipated losing is, is quite a bit different. Um, but yeah, so, uh, but no, dries back in 2016, that, that knocked me down pretty good. Um, I was, uh, I think it, I had like, you know, maybe like a $50,000 account. I had bled it down to maybe like 30 or, you know, I'd taken maybe one or two hits, um, down to 30 and then, and then in a couple of weeks, I grinded it back up over 50. Um, and then Dries pretty much took it, most of it. I think it was down to about 8,000. Um, and I, I took that and wired it to Sure, sure Trader and um, doubled that in a month and, and then kind of got some funds back. And I, I, and I went back to it back in January um, of 2017. In January 2017, I think that's kind of where profitability really started um, for me in terms of consistent throughout the years, um, better th- risk management, um, to where I wasn't having these, these losses that were taken, you know, weeks or months of my, my gains. 
And when you look back at the end of the year, it's just like, man, if you just would have would have cut it off, you know, at some point, not add or, you know, whatever the process may be, then, you know, your overall profitability would have been so much higher. So. Yeah, absolutely. So what's interesting is the rules from that specific stock has stuck with you all through all this time. Yes. So yeah, those no, lessons I, are ingrained in you. Yeah, no, I don't think I'll ever forget, like, after I took that loss, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there at my <laughs> my kitchen table and I'm just staring out in space. My wife's like, you're going to be OK. And I'm like, yeah, it's just it's going to take a little bit, but I'm going to be all right. But, you know, I, it probably took a couple of weeks. Like I was I was mentally pretty down, um, you know, obviously, like um, most big losses that traders take, um, you know, it can, it can take a toll on you for sure. You know, it's, I'm going to give a little background on, on dries D R Y S. Cause uh, you know, it, the newer traders probably like, what are, what are these guys talking about? Cause like, it, I don't think it's listed anymore. No, so, no dries actually went private. Um, it went private, but it's uh, in 2016, we had this company D R Y S. It was a shipping company. The whole shipping industry, uh, shipping stocks were all running because Donald Trump just became elected. And uh, for some reason, I forgot why, but the shipping sector and Trump was bullish. And they all went, and DRYS was the sector leader uh, because it had a, a, a micro float. I think it was like 400,000 float, uh, but no one really knows what the float is because it's not really regulated from, from what I understand. And it was just a massive short squeeze from like a dollar to 150 or something like that. And it's hard to even keep track of it. Well, now it's delisted. It went private or whatever, but it was hard because they did so many reverse splits that yep. it kind of got like, you can't, you can't look at the historical charts and even see it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I don't, did I sum that up uh, properly? What do you think? Yeah, pretty good. I mean, you know, yeah. dry is obviously is, um, the float, you know, who really knows what it was. I, I've heard it's basically anywhere from let's say 400 K to maybe two mil, but obviously it was super thin. Right. And, you know, uh, you know, obviously somebody probably locked the float and it was super manipulated, but it, it took days. Like, you know, I, I SPO the other day went, uh, that was just one day, but dry went from like, let's say, I don't know, two to four, four to 10, uh, 10 to 15 pulled back. 15 to 30 gapped up to 60 back down to 50 and the next day that gapped up from pre-market to 120 and they halted it uh, and then it opened i think around like 30 or 40 um and then maybe closed at like 15 that day or something but then they had some crazy uh what they call it was kalani uh dilution deals which is just i mean they just crushed the stock and just continue to reverse split they reverse split it and just sell so much stock. Like you literally almost needed a reverse split the day after they already reverse split. Um, and there were several shipping stocks that did the same thing. So tops, uh, S-I-N-O. DCIX. Um, S-I-N-O. I remember. So there, yeah, SINO. Um, and so, you know, obviously, yeah, I guess the other thing thinking back to that is that was my first, well, not the first, but um, the real kind of the main experience I've, I've seen with sympathy plays, right? So drives was the leader, what they call head of snake, you know, whatever you want to call it, but then you had all these other sympathies, right? And then, you know, when drives got cut off, I was able to kind of really see what happens to some of these sympathy names. And, you know, I, I couldn't really participate then because I had taken a loss in drives, but, you know, now, you know, when this kind of stuff happens in terms of sympathy runners, that's, that's actually where I make probably a good portion of my yearly money, um, you know, specifically on the sympathy names, because, you know, they're really only up just because the one stocks up. Um, and once the one cracks, there's a good probability, you know, nothing's guaranteed, but good probability that you get a, a pretty nice fade. Um, so uh, the other way around you can look at it is, um, you know, if, if you can look at the sector and, and kind of anticipate which ones may be sympathies, you know, there's some some massive money to be made on the long side. Um, so there's been several of those. Um, SPI had a couple, um, Sun, Sun W. Uh, so SBI goes, what, two to let's say 45 in September of 2020. Um, it was kind of a, a cold period, right? And so we had Sun W. Uh, I think NETE, which is now M-U-L-N, um, had a night like six to 18 gap. Um, Sun W gaps uh, 
what so SPI goes what three three to forty five call it and Sun W intraday goes one to three sixty comes back to one fifty. Um, and the next day in the morning gaps to eight. So I mean you're talking about what you know five to six hundred percent overnight uh, gain on some of those. So that's that's an area I've really focused uh, just because I think there's just you know the percentage gains on some of that just is so massive. Um, but there's there's been a lot of those sector runs. I mean we had the weed run and uh, with SNDL and Tilray and um, then there was another one with GLSI, uh, SLS, and uh, GOVX. Um, and then, I mean, just the last few days, right? You had ISPO was kind of leader, but then, I mean, so many of them, right? So many of these uh, D SPACs, I mean, were going nuts. The problem was yeah. it was so thin. Yeah, um, I think they were all, right? They were all D SPACs. Yeah, right. And, and then, for days, you know, they were halting like yeah, nonstop. They're, they're, <laughs> They're so thin and obviously locate super tough. And it's just like, man, like, you know, like, like CPTN off the open on Friday, like what, what goes to like 30 to 50 and then back down to like what, 15 or so. Um, so the volatility is insane, but um, it's good to see. I mean, obviously it's been super slow. Um, okay. I remember watching ISPO on Thursday and thinking this is, this is exactly what we need. The um, head of the sneak. That <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, that, you know, we just, we just need, you know, movement and, and things that draw attention to people like, you know, I, I could have bought this thing at 10, sold 100. Well, you know, good luck. But, but uh, you know, that's, that's really what we need. Just um, big movers. Yeah, woke uh, up the market. More attention come back yeah. on the market to kind of spark some things up, which is usually what happens. I mean, SPI was after a slow period. Um, you know, obviously AMC, GME just lit things up and uh, started 2021 um but yeah so you concentrate okay so i gather from all that that you're yeah. mostly short biased yeah I, i'd say let's probably 80 to 85 percent of the money that i make is on the short side um yeah i i, I definitely do some some long strategies as well like some of those i talked about um in terms of sympathy longs uh i didn't even mention dwac um so DWAC, PHUN, MARK. Um, I mean, that was an insane time. Um, so I think each one I get a little bit better. Um, and, and, you know, you're not going to even, you know, even if you nail one doesn't mean you're necessarily going to nail the very next one. But the opportunity is hum huge to to, to kind of capitalize on those. So DWAC, it, you know, was was big um, in terms of the, that time, uh, you know, PHUN. M-A-R-K, it was like C-R-T-D. Um, and then it just sparks other runners. And, and, you know, you got longs coming in and, and um, you know, buying it up, you know, way higher than it probably should go. Um, so when the time is right, then the opportunity on the short side is huge. Um, but yeah, back to your question. I mean, it, most of my money's made on the short side for sure. Um, but yeah. So how will you describe yourself? Okay, so the, we the sympathy players you went through, how would you describe yourself as a trader? Like, do you get a lot of data like uh, to play these things or um, what will you go by? Just discretionary. You see the sympathy play happening. You kind of go through the headline, the news, understand what's going on and the, the flow, whatever, or will you go by data and like systematic discretionary? Like how will you go about it? Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm actually not uh, too much of a data guy in terms of like, I don't track a whole bunch of stuff on Excel. Um, the way I kind of picture it, picture it is I have a, just a humongous Excel sheet in my brain. Like I just of all years. Um, and even when I wasn't super active, like in 2013, 2014, I mean, I would spend hours at night just looking at, you know, charts and, and whatever. I just, I, I had a passion for it and it just got, it just grew and grew. So, uh, I, th I think one thing that's underrated in trading is, is memory. Um, you know, so I can, I can, I feel like I, my memory is pretty strong in terms of what ter certain tickers have done, um, which, tickers have ran with other names in the past. Um, it, it needs to be quick. Like you just need to, you know, you need to react quickly. Um, cause some of it goes so fast. Like, you know, you, you can't really, you can't really mess around. You just gotta, you gotta go for it. Right. So, um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, um, data driven in terms of like, I don't have a huge Excel sheet. Um, but 
I do pay close attention to all my trades, all my executions, um, mainly on a visual standpoint. And then it just builds this, I feel like this humongous data set in my brain. So it's, it's, it's all discretionary, but I really think in the way like probability, um, but it's all based on experience. It's just like, okay, I've been in this situation so many times, you know, maybe 85 to 90% of the time it's going to work out. I do understand that maybe 10% of the time it may not. Um, and, and, you know, my stops there, um, you know, I, will I get upset if it doesn't sometimes, but, um, you know, I, I just, I really think in a way of, like probabilities, mostly like the probability of the stock to fading at this point, based on, you know, several different factors, um, you know, I feel like in, in my mind is high. Uh, so that's, that's where I get kind of conviction on the trade if, if certain things line up. Um, but yeah, I, you know, looking back, I think if I would have been more data driven in the, um, you know, more in the start, um, you know, probably would have helped, you know, here I am 10 years later and, you know, what are you going to do about it? But um, I guess the other thing that I think about, there's just, there's so many variables that go into certain trades um, and, and it's hard to explain, I guess, to a new, newer trader, but I mean, if you think of something like an Excel sheet that says short off the open, what are you going to do when DWAC comes around, right? So you got to think about market environment. Um, so you, you're not like, I, I short a lot of opens, but DWAC, some of those simply runners, I'm not going to mess with the open. Um, and if I do it super small and my stops, you know, fairly tight, but the dollar risk is pretty small to where I can get back in when it's time. Um, you know, like PHUN goes, what, 7 to 24 off the open? Um, you know, at, at that time, I think that was probably the strongest open I've ever seen. I've been trade yeah. opens, you know, for probably seven, seven years, you know, not every single open, but a, a lot. I mean, in the last, uh, last seven, eight years, I've traded a lot of opens for sure. Um, you know, that, and that, so I guess that's an example of, you know, like you, you can have your data, but, you know, in my mind, there's just so many other var variables that, that you got to take into account. Um, you know, like let's say the, the news, you know, but how is the market reacting to that kind of news? You know, like what happened when this stock had the same news maybe a month ago? How how the market react? Right? It's, it might be totally different than the way it was eight months ago or last year. Right? So really, a lot of it, the way I think about it, is is market environment, and it took me a long time to to learn that. Like some things that work in in some market environments just do not work in other market environments. Um, now, is that because you've, you know you've been through several markets environments over the years it's like yeah. i don't know someone told me uh you to spend a whole year trading so you could see like the seasons you experience a full year instead of taking like the summer off because you need to know how things trade in the summer right you know? so, so i agree well i guess i guess the other part about that is, is there can be some incredible opportunities in, in the summer even if, if some people say it's slow right i mean i think actually my third best month in 2021 was july right so if i take the whole summer off I'm missing out on quite a bit of money. Um, so I, you know, maybe I, I've heard of bigger traders taking off the summer or, you know, or some, maybe some bigger hedge fund guys, um, you know, will take off kind of slower periods, but, um, you know, you never know when you're going to get something like ISPO pop up and the next day you got to be ready, right? Because the opportunity potentially it could, could be pretty big that day whether it's February or whether it's June or, you know, the market doesn't care what month it is um, overall you know, through, throughout the years, it really depends on, you know, what's moving in the market, how much is it moving? Why is it moving? Um, you know, how, are, how different market participants are basically taking in and reacting to all this information out there. Right. So, and that can change, you know, anytime. Um, right. I mean, just like ISPO, I mean, it, that changes everything. You get something yeah. that goes from 10 to hundred in a super slow market, you know, it's, uh, you know, you, it changes things quite, a, you know, real quick. Yeah. So, um, I want to ask you also, so how did the whole seven points capital help you out? Like, uh, you know, improve as a trader. Cause you've had like a tremendous amount of success ever since a few years ago. Um, how does seven points factor in like the guidance you have these, you have access to ask these really good traders, like, questions uh that you have and you know and understanding the market conditions like you're saying like how like they just br break it down to you right then and you know 
when you instantly, when you have the question or how did that factor in? How did that help out? Yeah. So I think the biggest thing for me with seven points is just having just, just more strict risk management. Like, um, you know, you have your daily lock, um, you know, so if you retail, you don't really have like somebody like that looking over your shoulder all the time and you can easily kind of get frustrated or for whatever the reason, kind of just go a little crazy. Um, you know, whether you be oversized, you don't cut the position, you know, at seven points or trading prop with a risk manager, you know, that cuts a lot of that out of there because it's kind of out of your hands for the most part in terms of, you know, your loss is capped at your daily, daily limit. Um, you know, if you continue to hit that, it's going to be decreased. Um, you know, so, so that's kind of the main thing for, for me for that. Um, there is some, some pretty good, uh, networking, some other good traders, um, you know, you can talk to you throughout the day for sure. Um, but I think for me at this point, you know, risk of ruin is, is, is big. Um, you know, I, I feel like I already have the, to the skill set in the right environment to, to really do well. Um, but for every trader, there's still a blow up risk, right? So, um, you know, staying with the firm, that it's going to kind of pretty much eliminate that for me for the most part, because, you know, I'm, I'm not going to have one blow up trade because, it, you know, the, just the firm setting doesn't allow that, um, you know, in terms of you, you got your daily max loss. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of protected in that way. So, I mean, yeah, I guess it really boils down to, you know, you could probably call it accountability, right? So you're just held accountable. It's not your, it's, it's firm capital, right? So you got to treat other respect, um, you know, as, as you should your own money. I, I feel like I treat it with more respect than my, than my own money, just because um, I feel like it serves. I don't really want to mess around and lose it or lose a bunch of it. Right. So, um, you know, so that's, that was one of the biggest things for me. Um, yeah. You know, mainly, you know, risk management coming, come to the firm was, was probably the biggest thing um, that I've, I feel like I had a pretty good process coming in, but like I said, there was just sometimes I would kind of hesitate on a stop or, you know, I'd say, ah, oh, this business is small. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll hold it over and it'll come back tomorrow. And, you know, I, I think that I, I still had a concrete process, but there were still some lapses to where when I came with the firm, like I kind of cut all that shit out um which has been tremendous um, absolutely so re you're doing a re remotely with seven points but i think yeah. they have a physical office right i've seen photos of like yeah yeah so there. yeah so like when i talked to the cats back in 2018 i was it was just like you know i'm, I'm still working as a pharmacist um you know all, most of my hours are outside of market hours luckily um so i still have a ton of time to devote to the market when it's open um but I knew they had some remote traders. Um, and so I basically asked them if I could set them up remotely. Um, and, and they did have their main offices in New York City. I um, was able to go there actually in 2019 for a few days and kind of sit next to Cass. That was a really good experience to be in the office around other traders. And um, it, it was good. Um, but yeah, so they have the New York office. I mean, obviously when COVID hit, everybody went remote. Um, and now it's, it's, it's more of a hybrid deal. So I think like New York, you can, you can still go to the office if you want, but if you want to be remote, um, you know, you still can, uh, for me, I've always been remote, um, just cause I mean, I'm in St. Louis, so there's not really an office here, but, uh, the other office I got, I mean, Fort Lauderdale, there's one in New Jersey, um, Toronto, and then San Diego, uh, but after COVID, I mean, it, it's totally different since most people are remote for, you know, over, you know, a year, almost two, but, um, but yeah, main office still, still there in New York city. Gotcha. Okay. So now to some trading questions. So yeah. how, how, how quickly does it take for you? Do you go through like the, how quickly do you process to get into a trade? Like, what are you looking for? You have like a checklist. It takes you like a minute or two to decide yeah, whether I, you're going to trade it. It uh, usually doesn't take me long to be honest, especially if it's a ticker, that I've traded several times in the past. I mean, it can literally be seconds. Like if I see it in pre-market, I know exactly what's up. I, mean, I do research at night uh, to see like what moved in after hours the day before or what's, you know, maybe a day two play, something like that. But I mean, if, if I literally turn on my computer and I see, you know, XYZ doing this in pre-market, I'm in in like probably two or three seconds. Um, <laughs> uh, but my normal process, I mean, I, I'm looking... 
it doesn't take long. I mean, I'm looking at the daily chart. I'm looking at um, their SEC filings. I'm looking at the news, uh, maybe just a headline. But if I want to read deeper in, you know, I'll look into, you know, if it's some sort of biotech deal, um, you know, I'll, I'll maybe look more into it. Um, the problem with that is I'm, you know, sometimes I'm easy to poke holes in it and, you know, the stock's going to do whatever it's going to do regardless yeah. of what I think, like I said earlier. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think as I've gotten more experience, I, I've um, not tried to poke holes in it as much um, just because I don't want to get overly biased, I guess. Uh, but maybe a quick headline, um, you know, for the news, uh, I, I will go through some of them to, to look for some red flags for sure. Um, I use uh, Dilution Tracker has been really good resource um, that cuts your time way, way down. Uh, so that's been a good addition in the last year. Um, and I feel like they're improving things. So, I mean, they're, they're doing some incredible things, I feel like. Um, so that's good. Um, and I'm, I'm talking to other traders, you know, what, what are they watching? Um, mainly just for, for tickers, maybe a couple of thoughts here and there, but um, I mean, everybody kind of has their own, own approach. Um, for me, if, if I like it, you know, there's, I'm going to hit it regardless. Uh, you know, always going to put in a stop. My size may vary quite a bit, um, depending on several factors, market environment, float, uh, news, locate, uh, volume and pre-market, you know, price action, pre-market, stuff like that. Um, you know, so my approach, uh, on each trade may vary an incredible amount, uh, but that just comes with time. Um, and I think eventually you just kind of, you know, it just becomes second nature once you've traded so many years, you know, and seen so many different moves. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's mainly my process. I mean, I'm in, uh, IU chat, I use their kind of pre-market scanner. I feel like that's, that's pretty good. Um, and then, like I said, like I've, I've already kind of took inventory of what went on the prior day, maybe in after hours. Uh, that night, so I'm, I'm going through and kind of reviewing my trades from that day and then also looking for trades for the next day um, and kind of envisioning what I would want to see or, or what it may do. Um, but it, it doesn't take long. Um, not, too, not too long. For sure. Um, so you, you mentioned the fund, like the SEC filings, you're going yeah. through it. Like what, what's your, I'm guessing it's a quick process. Are you doing a yeah. key, keyword search or something or are you looking for dilution? Um, yeah, so uh, you know, I'm looking for let's say an ATM. When was when was the ATM filed? Like, is it fresh? Is it from 2020? Um, you know, if it's from 2020, I may look at a 10K or 10Q to see, you know, just a quick quick uh, Control F ATM, looking to see like how much I've actually used. Um, but I, I want the process as quick as possible because I may be looking at maybe seven or eight of them if it's uh, you know if we had a lot of movers. I'm looking to see which one's the biggest edge. If if I see something that say has an ATM, it's pretty fresh. And I, you know, you can obviously tell they need money. Um, you know, the news isn't that great. Um, you know, that's one I'm, I'm interested in for sure. Um, so I'm really looking, you know, right. You're really looking for supply demand imbalances. So if they got some sort of dilution, you know, is, is this supply going to overwhelm the potential demand is what I'm really looking for. Right. And, you know, if they continue to just sell it down because they have to, right. They just, they have to, they have to sell ATM to raise money to keep the company going. Right. So it's just the way it works. So, okay. Um, okay. So, so, okay. So you, you, you go through the process, see if there's an ATM. I'm pretty sure. Okay. If it's on dilution tracker, I guess they did the work for you, but sometimes some stocks from my experience, they're not on dilution tracker. Yeah. So you have to dig into it. Yeah. So I use dilution tracker, but I also use BAM SEC. So BAM sec. And sometimes yeah. for the same ticker, I will look at both of them because I, I mean, I used BMSEC for a while. So I feel like just in my mind, I, I want to see like the um, kind of the order of the filings, like when the dates were, like how recent, um, you know, you quickly see other offerings there. And I guess it's just, just the way it's organized. Um, and, you know, maybe something that um, those tracker missed, uh, you know, you can see on BMSEC or something like that. And obviously not every checker is on, on those tracker. So then, then I go to BMSEC to, to look real quick. Um, but I mean, even, even then that process doesn't take very long. I mean, maybe a couple minutes for a ticker at the most, I would say. So I'm trying to understand your process. Okay. So you go through that, 
check the and then like how do you decide and then simultaneously also you're deciding what you want to decide of with the news so how do you decide with the, how do you develop a bias in the news okay this news uh sucks this news is good this is bullish this might squeeze it's not bullish but it might squeeze like what how do you decide uh to get a bias in the news or to play the news yeah it's a good question i mean um, to be honest i'm mostly short bias on most of them um it'd be rare to say that i'm long bias on something off the open um so i'm usually willing to try at least you know once uh early uh, but my heart stops in and I'm not risking, you know, unless it's a, you know, a dynamite setup to where I'm, I'm super confident that this is going to work out quickly. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fine with taking a loss off the open, um, or, or early in the day, I guess. So I'm looking to, you know, pretty much scale it, um, you know, maybe an opening push, but then ideally not much more. Um, you know, I'm looking for weakness quickly bids being hit. Um, you know, big red candles on, on volume, uh, hard selling, uh, to kind of confirm, kind of confirm my thesis, right. Confirm they're selling. Um, but yeah, um, in terms of, uh, deciphering the news, like, like I said, I mean, I'm typically short biased, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, a lot of them, I don't want to look for too many reasons why I just know that, you know, I, especially if I've traded several times in the past, like, I just know that, you know, I'm going to try to maybe a little bit early if I do on the stop out and I'll wait for, for a different, uh, for a reentry uh, for the most part. Gotcha. Um, the reason why I ask is because I've seen like, yeah. for example, biotechs, I've yeah. seen a lot of them, they have the ATM there, like with right. a lot of, a lot of, you know, there a lot of dilution. And right. then they have like a phase one news and mm -hmm. I develop a bias and it still squeezes a yeah. lot. You know? Yeah. So I feel like sometimes when, even though they have dilution, they may need to get a higher first and then sell it back down maybe later in the day. Right. So sometimes mm -hmm. I feel like, um, you know, just the volume and liquidity just is not good enough at, around the open to get much of the ATM off. Uh, so however they do it, probably some fun that's working with the underwriter or, you know, all the kinds of games that goes on in small caps, but they need that price higher and then maybe sell it down later. Um, you know, how do you predict that? I mean, it's pretty tough. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you almost have to give them a little bit, maybe take a little stop. Um, you know, ideally you're not risking too much if it's, but I mean, you can, you know, off the, off the open, I mean, you know, like, for example, if it halts up off the open, it's probably not a good situation, right? That's a sign of massive strength. Um, you know, are there some good entries right after? Potentially. But, you know, a halt up off the open is not really something I want to see if I'm, you know, looking for confirmation of selling, right? That's exact opposite. Absolutely. So are you looking at resistance levels? Like how, how do the technicals come in, the, yeah. the historical resistance and all that? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it's mainly based on, for the most part, it's based on what is done in pre-market. Um, so ideally it's put in a, a, a pretty good high. If that, if it's significant off the high, I may use kind of another resistance. It looks like, um, you know, I may have had trouble with in pre-market. Um, and then depending on how it does open, um, you know, I'm looking to kind of pair that stop with the dollar amount I'm willing to risk. Um, so, you know, if I, if I want to risk, let's say, you know, let's say it's a $5 stock and I want to risk 50 cents, you know, I want to kind of scale in and then, you know, place my stop, you know, roughly, you know, let's say if it's a view every claim, but there's some, some resistance in pre-market a little bit under it too. Um, you know, I, I feel like that's probably a good stop placement to where, you know, if it hits, and I take the loss, then, um, you know, I can still look for re-entry. It's not the end of the world. Gotcha. And what about level two? How does level two factor in on this? Are you looking for like some heavy big sellers in there, some block orders? Uh, you know, how, how do you go about that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm taking in everything to, into account. So I'm taking in level two for sure. Uh, mainly level two. I mean, I'm looking for bids being taken out. Um, you know, I don't want to see a whole bunch of big bids holding or big bids continue to, to take the stock up. Um, so, you know, if I can see bids getting taken out, I mean, you know, some opens, you can just tell, I mean, they're just eating every bid, right. Whether it's ATM or some big holder selling or people that are up 
you know, from in the stock from much higher, um, you know, but you can tell pretty early, um, you know, if they're taking out those bids. Uh, so that, that's really what I want to see. Um, you know, I'm looking at time and sales. Like, let's say if you got a big bid and I'm looking at time and sales as it's kind of taking it out and you kind of, let's say there's, you know, let's say there's hundred K on the bid and you can see, okay, there goes 10 K, there goes 20 K and you can see it kind of, kind of diminishing. Right. So, and then once it gets close to being taken out, then eventually it gets taken out and washes ideally. And, you know, typically I don't want to see like a snapback. It would be kind of a red flag. Um, but I guess, I mean, the other thing is, you know, even if they're hitting, you know, if it looks pretty weak off the open, obviously there's some times where they can swipe right back. Right. Um, and that's where you have your stop, right? It's, that's why you have to stop in place because you never really know what's going to happen. Right. So, uh, but there are, I mean, you know, obviously there's, I feel like there's hundreds of years that, I mean, they open up and they just never come back. And, uh, and I capitalize on those things for sure. Gotcha. So are you trading like the full day or are you just focusing on certain parts of the day and it's like taking it easy and waiting or like waiting for, are you waiting for your setups or are you like a trading, you know, like look in a trade all the time? Sure. Um, so typically in a trade, yeah, for the whole day, uh, at least one, one or two trades for sure. Um, I am active off the open in the first half an hour, uh, mainly entering positions. Um, you know, if I take a stop, that's reason that's where I'm getting out, but I'm, if it's working, I'm rarely covering in the first, um, part of the day for that matter. I mean, ideally I want to ride the whole thing the entire day. I want to, I want to take everything I can get out of this thing. Now, sometimes, you know, you can call greedy and, and maybe they do come back, but the times they work, they pay for so many other red days. I mean, I can write, I can wipe out 10 to 15 red days in, in, in one really good day, um, depending on how the month's going, I guess. But, but regardless, I mean, you know, if, if you capitalize on some of the ones that I, I, did I feel like I really have edge in, then, you know, it wipes out so many other ones that, that don't. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I, I, so I'm active, you know, first half an hour, um, you know, if I get stopped, I am probably looking for reentry. Um, I may have, you know, certain set criteria of what I want to see to get back in. Um, but I'm not immediately for the most part ever getting right back in. Um, depends on the situation. Sometimes like, let's say if a top take a stop, you know, it slams right back down. Okay. I'm probably getting right back in and I'm, you know, obviously not the happiest at that point because I just top take a stop, but, um, that's the way it is. Um, and then, I mean, mainly in the afternoon, I'm, I'm looking for exits on those positions for the most part. Now, there may be some that let's say it's going to roll over in the afternoon, like like actually on uh, on Friday, that Sky H was the only one of these things that held up, right? There were so many that just got crushed um, and quickly, so quick, right? It's, it's It was hard for me to step in, in front of some of them because, you know, we just had one go from 10 to 100. So it's like, well, shit, I don't they're so thin that, you know, you don't want to get caught in a halt and can't even get out of it. So, but, you know, Sky H, uh, SKYH was one that, you know, if you're looking at an end of day, you know, it looks like, well, maybe they might kind of pull this thing, you know, into close. So there's a lot of setups like that where, you know, maybe it's, it's ran throughout the day and it starts to get weak the last couple hours, you know, and, and maybe you can go for kind of an end of day sell off, uh, something like that. Um, Sometimes like if I'm trading during the lull, I mean, it's just, uh, I just feel like there's not as much edge um, depending on the situation. I mean, there can be ones that pop up. Um, actually, it was one on uh, Friday. Actually, it was a uh, UNGY. Well, it was, it was uh, a AGIO actually. It was FDA approval, which actually wasn't even up that much. But um, a lot of those, if they don't go up, they go right back down. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, um, I mean, that one faded quickly from 31 to, to like low, uh, high 28, I think actually off yeah. the PR. So like something like that midday, if it comes out, okay, I'm, I'm probably going to get in, um, interested in something like that. Uh, so certain news pieces to come out midday, that may be actionable. You know, I, I may, I may trade some of those, um, since it's been slow, I've been kind of dabbling in other areas, um, trying to find edge in other places um some days it's good and some days i'm just like man i shouldn't even be trading this shit but um that's part of the slow market i guess and you know you come yeah. into the it's kind of frustrating because 
so you come in this year and it's like, all right, last year was good. Um, you know, this year, you know, I want it even better, right? I want, you know, to make X amount more. And then it's just so slow and the opportunity yeah. just, I, I mean, feel it's just not there. It's been yeah. The same feeling. I- <laughs> so it's, it's tough, but you know, the market can light up at any point and, um, you know, so you just got to stay ready. I feel like, but, um, I think the key on some of those others that I've been like, you know, like AMC, I mean, some days it fades phenomenal and some days it's just tough to trade. Like it just reclaims multiple times. looks like it's super weak. And then, you know, and, or if it's trading with the overall market, you get some Russian headline or, you know, whatever's going on. There's a lot of noise, right? It's just like, it's, it's not as much edge as like what I view in terms of some of the small caps. Um, you know, it's almost like trading a small cap, but you have like a PR risk midday. Like it's, it's some of these, just there's not as much overall edge that I've found in small caps for me personally. Um, but it may take some time too. I mean, there's obviously going to be a learning curve. You can't just jump into other sectors and be profitable right away. Um, you know, and, and also there's questions of, is it profitable at all anyway, over time, you know, there may be some days where you, make a little money or you catch a fade and, you know, but overall, if you trade that strategy for months or years, you know, is it profitable? I, maybe not. Um, so, you know, it is what it is, but. Um, do you have a, a favorite ideal setup? Yeah. I mean, um, I mean, mainly just small cap runner um, needs money. There's dilution press present. That's, that's fresh. Um and you can tell early they're selling. I mean, you can, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, maybe there's a pop off the open, but you can tell, I mean, they're, they're definitely diluting. Um, you know, it's, it's obvious dilution. And there's a lot of meal and bone, you know, maybe this goes from two to five or something like that, you know, uh, a lot of meat on it, uh, which we haven't seen many lately. I mean, I can still do, two, uh, I can still do well with ones that do, you know, maybe up 30, 40% as opposed to, you know, some that are up 200%. Um, but obviously I would prefer uh, one that's up massive uh, just to have, you know, you just got so much more room to come down. Right. So that would be ideal setup. Um, you know, I guess that's a little general, but I mean, it happens time and time again. Um, so, yeah. Um, and how about your most memorable trade or most memorable ticker? Yeah, it's a good question. I was, um, so I guess there's not, I guess one ticker that comes to mind, obviously, I guess, drives from, yeah, from way yeah. back. Of course, yeah. You can throw that one in there. But some of the uh, sympathy or the kind of the sector moves uh, really stick out over the years. Um, so, I mean, DWAC and PHUN and MARK, that was incredible. SPI, um, SPI and SunW and uh, PLO, PLO, PLA, um, and NETE. Um, and then what the weed run back in February was, was memorable for sure. Um, SNDL go, doing 4 billion shares intraday and, and just having so much volatility was incredible. Um, yeah. So, so mainly, I guess, generally just the sector moves, I feel like is, is ones that really stick out, um, in terms of one ticker, um, not really, I guess they're just, um, you know, I have a whole bunch of them in terms of, I know exactly how I traded it and I know, you know, how I did on it. Um, but there's not a, you know, there's not one, I guess it sticks out as, as the overall top, I guess. Uh huh. Okay, cool. And what, what hobbies or routines you got outside of trading? Yeah. So, um, I have, uh, two little boys, I got two under two, so that's, that keeps me busy. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a situation having two under two. So, um, that takes up, you know, a lot of my time for sure. It's been, uh, it's been enjoyable, challenging for sure. Um, so, uh, so I'm looking forward to, you know, obviously the family time has, has been really nice. Um, you know, being a full-time trader, I'm at home all the time. And so I'm, I'm there every morning and every night and, you know, helping out throughout the day, uh, here and there, if I can, if it's a slower day. Um, so that's, that's been good. Um, I do enjoy the gym, which as a dad has been a little bit different, but um, COVID obviously was a little bit different too, but 
Um, but it's still something I enjoy um, for sure in terms of getting workouts and, you know, trying to improve here and there. Um, and then um, I was uh, really into basketball as, as a younger guy in high school and in grade school, I guess, too. And, you know, for, so I've, I've uh, really enjoyed watching, I guess, so NBA, college basketball, stuff like that. It's, it's uh, something I'm, I'm pretty into, I guess, as a, as a hobby. Um, but yeah, it's, that's pretty much, pretty much what I do. <laughs> uh-huh. And uh, okay, so I'm thinking to your last podcast, with, with, yeah. um, Beyond the PDT. So what, what do you think is the main difference between now and then besides like the market conditions? Because, uh, you know, you had the whole pandemic craziness. So yeah. what do you think like prepared you or like, what do you think is the main difference between now and then? I think when I look back at like, you know, those times and, and where I'm at now, I think the biggest thing for me is my review process. Um, so I think it's been a, been a huge help to me. So, so every night, um, kind of before I go to bed, I uh, kind of come back in the office. And I review all my executions throughout the, throughout the day. Uh, so I pull up every chart that I traded that day. And I kind of compare it to the intraday chart. So I have one on one screen and one on the other. And so I'm looking for just takeaways. I'm going to challenge myself to just take something away from every trade. Right. And sometimes there's something to take away. Like it just, it didn't work. Right. But even if it didn't work, like, is there maybe some, you know, one candle that kind of signals where it's going to go wrong? What's the volume look like? Like what's the other candles look like? Um, you know, so I think doing that over time, every night, um, you know, over the years, can really kind of develop a sense and a feel for the market. Um, and so that's probably been the biggest thing for me. Um, I remember actually going back to DWAC and, and PHUN and stuff like that. After DWAC goes to, um, you know, the day one, right, after DWAC, I guess when stuff really went crazy. Uh, for, that was, that was the, the week after uh, was, was my biggest week. I remember having my, my biggest day on, uh, was on Monday um, after that week. And, and, uh, and I even, I came back that day and I, I just said uh, that, that night and I, I still reviewed and I, I still want to know, like, you know, even on, on, on trades, I did well, like, where can I get bigger specifically? Where can I add, can I put an ad and maybe have a separate stop? Would it, where, where could I place a stop? Like, would it be a little bit too, too tight? You know, how, how tight could I actually get it? Um, to where how you know how many shares can I put on to risk, you know maybe a smaller amount uh, in terms of like how much room would it actually need. Um, so that, that's been a big key for me. Um, you know I, I still you know I always want to do always want to keep improving, um, and so I, I kind of I, I constantly stay hungry to, to get better. Um, like I said, even after that that best day, like you know even if you make X like. You know, how am I going to make double? Why I got to get better, right? You got to, you got to still review and, um, you know, even on your best trades, like how can, how can, when that comes up again, like, you know, where can you improve on? And the reality is with the market, like you're not going to be perfect. Like there's no way, there's nobody out there that every single day they're perfect, right? So there's always going to be things that improve on, you know, even if you have a phenomenal day, there may be, you know, you may have made five to 10 different mistakes. Like if you traded, let's say, you know, six, seven different tickers. Um, you know, and I'm not saying get tops or bottoms. I really don't give a shit about that. But um, what I do care about is just is just maximizing the opportunity to trade. Um, so that's that's been the biggest difference for me. Um, I think the other thing for me is uh, I had my first son in, in March 2020, and and so it's a little bit different meeting in terms of you know the money is just not for me, like it's for my family, um, and I want to basically create generational wealth. So that what that's kind of what keeps me hungry um you know whether or not i spend that money or maybe a couple years or a couple generations down the line they get a little bit of it or you know or whatever but um you know if i can provide for my family and you know if there's good opportunities in the market like i want to take everything i can out of it um because ultimately like that's that's how i make a living so that's that's what i do that's awesome right there i, I love that that's that's pretty sick um and where do you see yourself in the future with trading? That's a good question. Um, so I, th- I think I'll forever be a student of the market. Like I'm always going to be a student, even as a, as a pharmacy student, like they always preach, like you got to be a lifelong learner. Like as a pharmacist, right, there's always going to be new drugs and stuff coming out, right? So 
same thing with trading. Like you always got to be a student in the market. There's going to be certain things that pop up um, that really work. And then certain things that have worked in the past that simply don't work, uh, you know, in the current environment, it may come back, you know, a couple months or a year or whatever, but uh, you always got to be kind of observing and uh, kind of taking inventory of, of what's going on. So, you know, I think the biggest thing for me is just to remain a student in the market, just, um, you know, continue to, to have an open mind, um, realize where my strengths are, but then also uh, kind of realize where my weaknesses are and, and kind of continue to build um, and improve. Um, I do have some kind of lofty overall p &L goals where I want to get, um, you know, maybe 10, 20 years down the line. Um, but, you know, eventually I, I think it would be nice to, um, you know, have, have some time where I can take a little bit of time off. But right now I'm, I'm so passionate about the market at this point in my life. Like I, I don't want to take any days off, right? I want to, even if it's a slow day, like I may be researching a trade that may happen, you know, next week, or I may be researching a biotech that may be a good trade in six months or, um, you know, so I'm, I'm still trying to stay busy, um, even if, let's say, I'm holding a couple small caps, you know, the entire day. Um, you know, and, and I, you know, even if I'm, I guess, holding those and, you know, I'm still obviously monitoring and, you know, maybe adjusting here and there if there's something I don't like or something like that. But, but yeah, in terms of where I see myself, I mean, I'm just going to continue to to grind it out and continue to try to get better um each and every day and i think if you if you can improve just a little bit every day then over time you can you can have something special uh whatever that means for the certain trader everybody's got different goals different abilities um you know even if you mess up like there's there's learning learning opportunities there and even if, even if you have a phenomenal day like you can there's still things to to get better like you know if you had, let's say you had 100k how can you have 200k on right um you know, whatever your PL, how can you make maybe 50% more? Um, so there's there's just so much, you know, the market, and you know, there's always different companies IPOing and uh, uplisting, and you know, like we had these D specs Thursday and Friday. I don't know shit about any of these stickers, right? Um, not that it even matters, right? They're gonna go ballistic regardless, but um, but yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting um occupation that uh, always always keeps you busy uh, there's always something to learn absolutely yeah. absolutely and uh and lastly any book recommendations yeah so um i'm not a huge reader but i think if i would recommend um i, I feel like the uh like market wizards um good recommendation uh mobo momo traders is is one uh that i yeah, i remember I like that one too. I glue. I was glued to an uh, on a plane ride. I remember, I just I read the whole thing on a plane ride, and it was like sometimes I, I feel like if you have a passion for trading, like you can get into some of those, um, and you just kind of dive into their stories, and it's just it resonates, it resonates with you so much. So, um, yeah, I, I feel like those those are, are good. Um, Atomic Habits, uh, which I haven't read personally, but I, I do know that uh, you know many people recommend it for trading. Um, actually, I actually have a a neighbor that's uh it's reading it i was over at a super bowl party and, and he had it on his uh desk there and I, I was asking him a little bit about it but um but yeah that one um but yeah i i'd say mainly mark wizards um and, and momo traders i really enjoyed that one for sure good stuff well bryce um once again congrats and all the success man and Thank you. uh yeah, very inspiring overall, man. It's awesome. Keep it up. And uh, yeah, we'll keep in contact. Thanks for coming Thank on the Friendly Bear Podcast. You have a great yeah, day. Yeah, appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks, Bryce.